We're right around the corner from Stadium Super Trucks. That is Speed Energy. Stadium Super Trucks presented by Traxxas is getting gridded up and ready to go now. As uh, those of you around the track, they're lucky enough to have a spot with one of these ramps. You see a Toro Tires and Traxxas uh, ramps being set up. There are four jumps out on this 2.14 mile course as they are getting set in place right now. Matt Bingay making a move. His team ain't the same. Matthew's first stunt that I remember him doing was when he was three and he had a little two-wheeler bike and he would do wheelies on it. Not just ride his bike but do wheelies on it and we used to be gobsmacked because <laughs> there's this little three-year-old doing wheelies on a little two-wheeler bike. He was a tough little cookie as well. If, um, if he was naughty and he'd get a smack on his leg, he would stand and put his hands on his hips and look at me and say, didn't hurt. And I'd think, oh my God, what have I got here? What am I gonna do? <laughs> and we worked out pretty quickly that the best way to punish Matthew when he was naughty was make him go to his room and stay there. Matt hated it because he had to be outside doing stuff. And I didn't mind because I was a bit of an engineer as a kid and I'd, I'd make cool stuff out of Lego and uh, amuse myself for hours. So if we were sent to our rooms, it was like, yes, fine. I was a pure outdoors kid. My brother, Christian, he was a nerd, he was a geek. And you're quite happy to put it on, he was a geek. He loved his Lego, loved his McKenna. He'd sit in his bedroom and just play Lego and McKenna all day long. I couldn't stand my bedroom. I couldn't stand, I'd be under the door. Can I come in, can I come out if I ever got ground in my room? As for fear of doing tricks on bikes and jumping off banks into a river or climbing trees or whatever, he never had any fear. Someone said, what do you want to do for, you, for a job when you leave school? And he said, do wheelies. And we thought that was pretty cute and had a laugh as well. And, and the funny thing is, that's exactly what he did. I left school and straight away and became a butcher. And I was a butcher for only a few months and then got a job as a bike mechanic. And um, it was the best job in the world to me because at the time that's all I wanted to do was be a bike rider, a bike mechanic. And so I was a bike mechanic for four years um, at Brisbane in Kawasaki. And I um, loved it, loved every minute of it. And that was, I was a bike mechanic for four years and that was when I became a stunt rider. I thought, Matt, what are you doing, mate? Kind of like when someone says, I'm going to quit my job as whatever to be a rock star or an actor. You think, dude, like probably less than 1% make it in this industry. Are you sure you know what you're doing? But he was so committed and he was so passionate about it. And I kind of, th and mum and dad were on his case. They were, they were pretty heavy on him. 
And I just said, look, he's only, eight, I think he was 18 or something at the time. I said, who cares? Like, he's 18. If it doesn't work, he'll go back to fixing bikes. My parents hated the thought of me doing a stuntman. Dad was so against it, so, so against it. And his thoughts were, I'm not going to wipe your bum when you're a paraplegic and in a wheelchair. And he was real nasty about it, um, which made me think long and hard about it. But I, I desperately wanted to be a stunt rider. We were horrified. His dad and I, we said, no, you know, there's no future in it. No, <laughs> you can't do that. Um, and we, we really hated the thought because we thought it was just a flash in the pan and nothing would come of it. We didn't encourage him one tiny bit. And he wanted to prove us wrong. And he did. I'm a man on a mission. trial and error, it's very different these days. Um, just go out and practice, 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 and, and you, you stuff up, and you break a bone, and you work out what you did wrong, and don't do that again, and it was, it was a tough road. It certainly was very, very tough. We all sort of fell off, but it was all part of the parcel of what was going on with the job. I think we all fell off, but like it was never an issue. It was just something that, you know, you, you got laughed at, like, ha, 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 it was your turn to fall off today. Yeah, that felt good, not. I'm a man on a mission. I don't need no permission. I'm a man. It was almost like the bike was an extension of him. He could make that bike do anything. I think Alan Morrison dared me to put these spikes on, so we made these big spikes and glued them onto my helmet. And I asked Mohawk, because I always ran a Mohawk. I did the spikes, and then the, the next event, I think, was Adelaide, and I obviously took them off again. And the amount of people that came up to me going, oh, where's the crazy dude with a spiky helmet? And about 10, 15 people were asking, where's the crazy dude with a spiky helmet? I'm a man on a mission. Grew and grew and grew for me. Um, I obviously did the first few, few years um, by myself. And so I got my good friend Rob Ro Boulder. We teamed up and got a sponsor, Donut King. So we're the, the Donut King Sun team. And from then it blossomed um, into cars as well. So we got cars and bikes. Every promoter wanted more riders and more cars. And it was, it was very hard to do on, on the budget they're providing. But um, I managed to pull off and um, it certainly don't look back on it. I think his big break was doing Mission Impossible 2. I thought it was dodgy at the time, but they called call up the audition as Tom Cruise's stunt double for Mission Impossible 2. At the time I was like, oh, what the? It took me a while for it to sink in. And so they flew me down from um, Brisbane down to, down to Sydney for the audition and I rolled up at Eastern Creek Raceway. I think there were about 10 people applying for the job at the time or auditioning for it. And I saw all the guys race around the track, race around the track. And I wasn't going to race around the track. I wasn't racing, so I was a natural born idiot. I was, <laughs> I was a film boy, so I thought I'm going to be completely different to them. So I jumped on these brand new, spanking new Triumphs. And um, I started busting wheelies and stoppies and sound up donuts. And at the time I had um, my titanium steel shoes. And I've never jumped off the back of the bike before, but I thought I'd bugger it. I'm here for a reason. So I flat out about 140 k's down down the straight and jumped off the back of the bike and skied behind it. And I had the whole crew, the whole, everybody just sitting on the wall just going, oh my God, cheering me on. And because of all the stunts I just did, they rewrote the script about all the stunts I could do, like skiing on the bike and stoppies, and I did a big donut and made a smoke screen. So most of the, the script, the, the movie was was based around what I actually did on the bike.
I suppose that was the turning point for us that we thought okay maybe he can make a career out of this. I have a huge big call for Bollywood movies. I worked on a Bollywood movie here in India and, and Dubai and commercials over here in Australia. So the biggest drama I had with, with movies was quite often do a movie for a week and because of my, um, my call to performing and sponsors, I have a movie call up and say, can you do a movie? And I'd have, I have a Adelaide 500 or Formula One or Maribyrg Grand Prix on that same week. So I had to say no to the movie because my, my career took hold of it. barometer is the crowd. If the crowd's yelling and screaming, he just wants to go harder, you know, and as long as they're doing that, he will keep giving 110%. With him personally, he's just a, he's a fun guy and he's a loose unit. I'm a wanted man. He's relentless, he doesn't stop. But I guess that's probably why he's successful at what he does, because he is relentless. But that's with every aspect. You know, you just can't, you can't hang out with him and just have a, a normal time. It just, it norm, normal's not in his agenda. Take inspiration from him, he's, he's just like a consistently successful dude. The drift cars have kind of stepped up fair way from when we originally started. Initially they were just Commodore Utes back then. Now Matt's has gone to a whole new level. It's a custom built Camaro with a NASCAR engine. It's got an Albans transaxle gearbox in it, you know, 800 horsepower, revs to 8,500 RPM. So his is definitely off the chain. He brings a show that entertains people. Um, and certainly in my time at Clipsal 500, one of the biggest things was that you wanted to keep people engaged with what you were doing on track, but also you wanted to have someone that was good off track, which is what he's tremendous with. Uh, with his partnership with Hot Wheels, um, you know, it brings families. When I got Hot Wheels, I couldn't be happier. Um, part of my sitting down with the head marking woman, um, I said to her, I've got a hot wheels in my hand. I said, what does a kid do when they get a car? They do, do donut slides and they jump and do wheelies. I said, that's what I do. That's what I do for a living. So we're giant hot wheels toys. This is my little boy's birth. I'll never live this one down ever. Um, I was over in Dubai filming a movie um, called, called Race, down the mountain, the biggest hill in Dubai. I got a phone call about one o'clock in the morning while I was in Dubai. I knew exactly what it was. And I'm like, oh! And um, yeah, she, his mum, Beck, was, was pregnant with Madzi, and she was about to give birth, so I thought, oh my God, so. She didn't give birth to him for a good few hours later, so we're actually filming at the time. And um, I got a phone call again, and we shut down filming on the whole mountain. And I told all, all the producers, all the directors, everything, what's happening. My little boy's just been born. And I sat on top of the biggest mountain in Dubai with my mate Cam on the bottom. I smoked a fat cigar. I don't smoke, but I just puffed on a fat cigar uh, for the birth of Maggie. I couldn't go from the airport to home fast enough. But, uh, I just constantly think about my little boy. So when I, when I walked into the room, my little boy, my manager there, I certainly got, I got, got teary at the time, and uh, that was the best moment of my life. Need for Speed mm -hmm. runs in the family, with his son, seven-year-old Maddox, wanting to be just like his dad. And Matt and Maddox Mingay join us now this morning. Good morning to you both. Good morning, guys. Maddox Evil, he's, uh, he wants to carry after his dad and follow his dad's footsteps, so I've got him an awesome little miniature truck. I've got an exact replica of my stadium super track. So I'm about to present it to him and uh, see his reaction. I think he's going to lose it. Open your eyes. Oh, cool. 
He rode his first motorbike three days before he turned three. And uh, we got him in a, in a jump track uh, very early, I think it was eight or nine. And uh, this, this year, brought out his brand new drift car. Dad used to always pick me up from kindy on my peewee and all the kids used to come up to the gate and they used to think it was so cool. And all the kids come running over, Madge has gone trotting out with his helmet on and he's only like three or four years old. And uh, all the kids have been lined up holding the fences, staring at Madge in awe. You know, a great, quick, quick story I want to mention. Uh, Minge, uh, first time racing the truck, finishing on the podium, getting the third place yesterday. We're about to go green right now. Robbie, go to the side of the I knew that a guy that could drift a car would be a perfect fit for Stadium Super Truck because it's a lot of drifting, a lot of sliding. But not only was this guy a drifter, he at that point already had his little jump truck. You know, he was playing in the off-road stuff and he was a fan of, of the dirt as well. So having those two traits together was, I knew it would be a, a good recipe for a competitive driver. Oh, Matt is one of the best stadium super truck drivers to ever, you know, get in that truck. Uncomfortable sideways feeling that teaches you to be a better race car driver. With stadium trucks, it's a throwback to old school racing. There's really no other feeling like jumping a stadium truck. I've never raced a car, and so I got a CAMS license and um, got a, a wildcard entry, and it's certainly a wildcard. Um, and it was right down my alley. The, these these same trucks were sideways all the time, or in the air. Is what, what I did for a living as it was. So my very first race, very first race, and, and, I, and I laid my first outing at SSC truck. I got third. coming in, rounding out your top three. I try to explain to people, you know, what is Stadium Super Truck? It's it's honestly like trying to ride Bambi on ice. It's like going around Mike Tyson. It's hard work. It's so exciting. It, I like to say it's uncontrolled chaos. The best form of raw racing that you can have pretty much on the track. The hardest, angriest, fastest guy usually wins. And when I told people I was going to start this truck series, um, everybody kind of laughed at me. But then I started saying, well, hang on a second here. If trucks are 50% of the vehicles in the world and the aftermarket business is 70% truck based, when you look at the automotive industry, and NASCAR and V8 supercars and IndyCar can survive, there's no reason this truck thing's not gonna go off the chart. As soon as those things hit the track, it, it turns to five to seven people deep the whole way around the tracks. When you see the fans running to the fence. We turn people into waffle bellies, and everybody's like, what's a waffle belly? They, well, they're so close to the fence, they got the waffle pattern on, on their bellies. Mingay's still blaming me for that one, so uh, yeah, I, well, I, I knew he was coming, so I was just like, oh, I better give it a little bit of a brake check. And he jammed his brakes on way before he should have, and I was sideways, I hit the ramp sideways, which is a big no-no. Hit the ramp sideways, he's not going to end pretty at all. Pretty much pitched the truck sideways, and um, yeah, we see a wheel flipping down through the track. His truck started tumbling, and uh, a gentleman named Burt Jenner was right behind him and I was right behind Burt Jenner and I'm like, oh my goodness, that was a spectacular wreck. As Mingay does, he climbs out on the roof and salutes the crowd. That is funny, like he just didn't care and people are like, but you could see the, the scrutineers are like this to him and he's just like <laughs> Yeah, he is a showman. I probably wasn't planning on using those two skills in this race, but uh, there he is. Takes 
see a Matt Mengay come in and, and be able to, to win here at Gold Coast right away. Um, you know when a guy has talent and he's capable of doing it. I left the door a little bit open and and uh, yeah, that's where Matt just, just prized me out of the way, grabbed the gear and, and, and took off and I was pretty disappointed but I was pretty happy for him as well on his home crowd. It was mixed feelings really, so uh, I lost the race, he won it. It was good, good day for the Gold Coast. Matt does a skid past the apartment and then pulls up with the ute in reverse to the building. And I've looked at the back and it said, will you marry me, Sheenzy? And I just about died. I now know what people talk about when they say they made the love of their life because I believe I've done exactly the same. Um, she's been my backbone to my everything. She was there for me with my whole injuries. Um, she's my best mate in the world. We had some of our drivers that were racing the Baja 500 and racing Detroit. So we had a couple of seats that came open. Um, my truck came open and um, one of the Safecraft trucks came open. So Matt, obviously he put his hand up and said, you know, love to come and race, uh, love to be part of it. To race over in Detroit, like the capital of motorsport in the world, um, it was too good of an opportunity to turn down. So he just went for it and we were all in. I got a call from my really good mate, Robbie Gordon. He um, gave me the opportunity to race in Detroit. So, you know, I just said, I, I grabbed it and um, never looked back. Oh, so I look back now. Right around the corner from Stadium Super Trucks. That is Speed Energy. Stadium Super Trucks presented by Traxxas is getting gridded up and ready to go now. As uh, those of you around the track, they're lucky enough to have a spot with one of these ramps. You see a Toro tires in Traxxas uh, ramps being set up. There are four jumps. Looking forward to this one. Yesterday's race, a little bit sedate by SST standards, but I think today the tempo is going to be turned up. And they are ready to rock and roll today as uh, we should be going green momentarily now. Getting set for this race, second of the weekend, green flag waves, and we are underway for race two of the Speed Energy Stadium Super Trucks presented by Traxxas. Now they've been told through one and two to keep it calm, but from this point onwards, they can unleash the beast. Viso down the inside of Minge, who was not happy with his efforts yesterday. He's still coming to terms with a concrete surface. Now we don't race on anything like that back in Australia. This oh, three races going on. <laughs> Look at the two safe drive trucks. He's squirming their way down into turn number three. Absolutely bad. as another truck gets into the wall, Nerf bars. It is absolute chaos and mayhem out here in lap number two. Mingay's truck on its side with the roof off. So red flag is gonna come out on lap number two. Now this is very odd. Not too often do you see a red flag come out in Stadium Super Truck. This is something different uh, that we have only seen one other time in uh, Stadium Super Trucks racing. It could be a combination of a couple things, Matt. Uh, obviously we've got uh, Matt Mingay up on his roof playing turtle right now. So that being said, Matty Minge, a professional stuntman, uh, some bumps and bruises again. Uh, our, our prayers are with him that uh, he will be all right. He is a tough man. And uh, you see him, that ambulance come by, give him a big thumbs up. He is a wonderful, wonderful man with his beautiful wife, Sheena here, who uh, were actually just married. Uh, not all that um, so when I first got to the hospital, I was taken into this little room and this guy sat me down and he said, there's so many blanks, like I, I must have gone into shock. So wait, there's only bits and pieces that I remember, but I remember him sitting me down and he was like, are you asking if I was okay? And asking if I had any questions. And he said, look, 
Matt, like, he didn't know what my husband's name was at that stage, but he's like, your husband's come in here and um, to look at him, it looks like someone's put a gun to his, his chin and pulled the trigger. Um, his jaw's completely smashed open um, and he's lost a lot of bone and he's got teeth fragments everywhere. And the main concern is that um, he's suffered a significant brain injury. I remember his response being, well, we don't know if he will ever wake up again. As he was passing me, I was like, like, wow, like this is a ballsy move, you know, and I couldn't do that, like what he did. And he had, he had the turn, but it was a big curb and he barely touched that curb, but it kicked the truck up into a bicycle and he just couldn't save it. And then a wall was right there. And I look up in my mirror and I'm, you know, I'm trying to talk on the radio saying, you know, you know, his head is on the asphalt. So, I mean, I thought he was dead. You know, something that you should be able to just walk away from, right the truck back and, and keep racing. So uh, it wasn't until we got back around and we, we re-entered the pit lane, which was basically where the accident happened. Um, you could see there was emergency workers and a fair bit of, bit of work going on around the truck. So been around a long time in racing and when you see that, you, you, you think, OK, well, he's in a bit of strife. So that's when it, everyone started to get a bit worried. I decided to call Christian, Matt's brother, because Christian lived down the road from Matt's parents. So I thought, rather than telling them over the phone, it'd be better if I tell him and he can go up to their house, sit them down and tell them in person. So I remember calling him and it was almost like I didn't know, I didn't know how to put it into words because as soon as I said it, it all of a sudden became real. She explained that he died a couple of times on the way to the hospital and he'd had massive facial uh, trauma and possible brain damage. That's the bit that got me the most was the possible... I, I, I could live with an ugly brother, but a vegetable brother, that's uncool. That shook me. It took my breath away. Like, I didn't know. I was a bit numb. And then I just knew that I had to get over there and look after Sheena because that's a hell of a job for... They, they'd only been married a little while, you know. A new wife having to look after her husband in, in a hospital bed as a basically a vegetable, not knowing what's going to happen, uh, that was pretty bad. I think it was about 12 hours before I actually got to see him. I was expecting him to wake up, um, but he was heavily sedated for quite a while um, and he just had connections everywhere. He had tubes everywhere and because he had so much damage to his chin and there was so much bleeding, a few times he was suffocating on his own blood and, and bone fragments and teeth and stuff. So I remember by the time I actually got in there because he'd been in recovery and, and then been in his room for a little while before we got in to see him, they ended up putting like these papers under my um, hand straight away and said look do you mind we really need to like drain his lungs because we're just a bit worried about how much fluids in there so straight away it was like getting a tube and putting it in his trachea and like draining his lungs and you see like all this blood filling up in this bottle and this is the person that you you love and you just saw him and they were happy and they were so excited to go out and race and then all of a sudden like like that life just changes. At about 4am, um, I woke up to a knock on the door and it was Christian. And when I first saw Christian, um, you know, I said, oh, you know, how, what are you doing here so early? You know, what, what's going on? And he said, Mum, Matt's been in an accident. And Mum wanted to go straight away. And I said, no, you're not going, Mum. You, what are you going to do, cry? Like, you're going to stand there and cry all day and that's not going to help anyone. Um, especially mum, and so I made the decision pretty quick to say, mum, you can't come, and I got dad to back me up and say, don't let her get on a plane. Um, and then we just worked out the logistics of getting me there ASAP. I think I was fairly prepared of what, what I was going to see. I knew there was going to be tubes and 
you know, bits and pieces hanging out of Matt and he was going to be in a bad way. But it still takes your breath away when you see your brother in that sort of state. But I, I think I just kept my mind on the fact that I'm here to do a job, let's get this job done. Started talking to the doctors and nurses. Robbie Gordon turned up shortly after, um, gave me a bit of a debrief on what actually happened. Uh, he insisted that I fly out to Charlotte to his workshop to see the truck and see the roll cage and the damage for myself. Because we own the series, okay, and, and we are in the entertainment business, obviously what we have is we have cameras everywhere. We have cameras inside each guy's car, we have cameras outside each guy's car, and if we didn't have those cameras, nobody even understand what would happen. His truck hit the wall, but the wall moved. Like, the wall moved a lot. You know, it's, it's very frustrating from my point of view because, you know, we look at it and it's like, ah, oh, you know, the cages aren't strong enough on the car. But if you look at it and you see what really happened, it's, um, it's an eye-opener. Matt came out of a corner too fast, was up on two wheels, was just going too fast and fell onto the side of his door, slid that way into the concrete barrier, it should have just run along the side of the concrete, but because it moved and then the next one and all the ones behind it stopped it moving, sheared the roof and it hit with such force, the top left corner of the uh, roll cage was just sheared off and you could see the shear marks in the tubing and that corner of three bars shot into Matt's chin and basically exploded his face. So it like came apart and it almost was like a can opener. As it continued on through, that concrete block that sheared that off hit Matt in the head just up here and you can see in his helmet the big shatter mark. And then that pushed Matt's head back into the seat and you can see the cracks in the back of the helmet where Matt's head hit the back of the seat that hard that it fractured his neck. And it hit with such force it spun the car around 360 and as it flipped it had no roof and Matt's head rotated under the car as the car flipped over and was only inches from the ground. So it was pretty close to having his head torn off basically in the roll. Yeah, you got a star picket trying to hold a fence together that's got an opening that wide, something's got to give when it hits it. I don't think that anything would prevent um, the damage uh, that would happen if the wall shifts. Nothing could have st stood up to this. No, no vehicle on earth could have survived this. It's your partner and it's your soulmate, it's your best friend and to suddenly think all of that might be taken away, it was, it was really scary. He just had a blank look on his face like he was, the lights were on but no one was home. And that was scary, um, that was pretty hard to, I found it hard to look at him sometimes because it, he didn't look like my brother anymore, it looked like some dude that kind of looked like my brother but wasn't in there. And um, that was pretty rugged and every now and again he'd reach for my hand and squeeze my hand as if to say, uh, I know it's you bruv, I know you're there. And that was cool. Uh, I, that was a glimmer of hope that Matt was in there and uh, he was going to be okay. The biggest thing for me was uh, I was thinking about Matt and thinking about his wife and, and, and what she would be going through. And like to, to tell you the truth, how she handled that whole situation was just completely amazing. I'm probably getting a bit emotional talking about it right now. Do you want to give us a big thumbs up? Yeah. Good work. He's such a determined person that I owed him everything to make sure that I put on a brave face so that he didn't see any fear. So it is Thursday, day six, and he's just had his first sip of water, which is awesome. From the very get-go, the worst case scenario is what I was dealt with. So 
I kind of had it in my head that, okay, this is the worst case scenario, it can't get any worse than that. So from that point on, it was more a matter of, okay, out of the next bit of information, if there's one thing that is good to come out of it, then it's a good day. Okay. Oh, look, he's already doing it on his own. I didn't even do it. He That's awesome. It. Good job, Matt. Push well done, right babe. Got to a point where we were like, okay, let's try and see what we can get out of him. So we put a computer under him and tried to get him to like press the keys to type something. Even just to see like what his brain capacity was at that stage. I remember the boys then wrote out the alphabet and tried to get him to like move his hand across the letters and say something. And with his left hand, he put his finger and it was very, very time consuming and he'd wobble his finger across a letter and go, mm. and we'd go righto, and we'd, we'd say it out aloud and he'd sort of nod. And he spelled out, um, oh, the first thing he spelt out was where's mum? And I still crack up with that. Because I wanted to be there and he's my boy and he just said, where's mum? And I thought, why aren't I there? And I still, I still feel terrible that I wasn't there. But anyway, he doesn't remember that at all. So, so that's good. But you always need your mum. <laughs> we were just walking down the path and it was just, you could see him just sit there and just taking in the fresh air and then I saw this magical moment where he just, he puts his hand out and as we were walking past there's just little bits of a, a flower and he just ran his hand through it. That was a really heartfelt moment, it was like, oh okay, there's got to be someone in there, let's try and like get him out and see what else we can explore. You can break my body, but you can't break love. There you go. You gotta hold it with both hands. All we yeah, have go, is babe. There we go, now we're standing tall. Straight posture and everything. Well done. Your fearless blood flows in Watching Matt walk for the first time in Detroit was pretty emotional. I remember I helped him for a little while and then I think Sheena or one of the nurses took over and I was standing behind him watching him. And it was a mix of emotions of great to see my brother progressing but horrible to see my brother struggling to walk. So this is walk number two of the ICU. You can only encourage your brother so much and then at the same time you knew that he was feeling so frustrated that he can hardly even walk that he doesn't want to be patronised by his big brother by saying, oh, you're doing really great, bud. go home now. It's Nearly. Awesome. Two more days. So when they said we could go home, there was a little bit of caution in it. Like, are you sure? Like, we didn't want to do that in case it was going to be to Matt's detriment. But relief mainly of, yes, we're going home. So it's Saturday. <laughs> it's the last day today. And Matt's decided to take over. <laughs>
I don't remember a single day, a single minute of, of me being in America, apart from being on a plane going to America. Um, it kind of got wiped from my memory totally. I, I, only, only recollection, I, only thing I've seen is, is, is footage of me pulling tubes out. And from that, I don't want to watch anymore. Um, so it's all news to me, so I, I hate the thought of it, I hate looking at it. Now, the, the first time my memory started coming back to me was about a week after, I, oh, about a few days after I got come back to the Gold Coast. And they unwired my jaw, thank God, so I could finally eat something. Put something in my mouth, which was a horrible feeling to have a white jaw wide shut with half a jaw. But um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of grateful that I don't have much of a memory of it because um, I know it's a terrible time for everybody. Slow. In a lot of respects, I was, I was amazed at how Matt recovered really quickly and then in other respects, it did lag on with his brain damage and his, his uh, right side not working and that really yeah. frustrated Matt, no end of course, um, and that was hard to see. It was very difficult with Matt because he wasn't dead, but he wasn't alive. He was in this like limbo land. Pretty confronting, you know, just watching him and thinking far out, like, what's going to happen here, you know? Is he going to be like this? Or, you know, I don't know anything about brain injuries. We've spent our life doing wheelies and stuff on bikes, not worrying about that. And, and looking at him, it was just a real massive shock. Seeing Matt and the state that he was in, in his recovery, there was one bit of information that I found out that unfortunately I had to keep from him. And that's the fact that I was pregnant. And at this stage, he was not able to retain information. He was basically learning how to do all the things that we take for granted, which is like learn how to walk and talk and do all the basic things. Once we finally got to that point and he'd rehabilitated enough, um, I told him and it, it was such a special moment like we were so happy together and it gave us something to look forward to and something to plan for for the future because at this stage we had no idea what the future held for us. In the same token I was so petrified of what had actually, in the events that led up to it, what I'd put my body through basically because I knew that there were days where, there was three days three whole days where I didn't sleep. I didn't eat anything. I was surviving on coffee. Um, and I just, I just had this feeling that something terrible was gonna go wrong. And unfortunately, that became reality. On the 24th of August, that was when we found out that um, we would have to say goodbye to our baby. and it's probably the hardest thing we've ever had to deal with. Um, I remember just going into a deep dark hole and it was almost like the roles had reversed. With Matt being the patient and me having to care for him, but he was then having to care for me and I was in a hospital and we had to say goodbye to our little baby girl. You know, it was a terrible time. As if I hadn't put enough, enough, through enough already, and then she's got to deal with this again. Um, I was terrible for me, more so terrible for her. So I felt it was all my fault once again. So I can imagine how I felt pretty bad. What injuries do I have? My accident. How long have we got? <laughs> oh look, my, my list of injuries is more long. Uh, a lot of them are so technical I can't even pr pronounce the words. But basically I, I, um, I broke my neck, uh, I broke my top jaw, I completely shattered my bottom jaw, lost nine teeth. Uh, I had fluid on, on the lungs and the worst one of all was a massive big brain injury. So I had, I had um, at the time, I didn't know that, but it wasn't until I was at Gold Coast, so I found out I had a massive bit of blood on the brain, so I had to have brain surgery. 
So after Matt had been in hospital doing his 10 weeks of rehab, they were happy with how he was progressing and they felt safe that uh, he was able to come home and, and be able to walk up and down the stairs and not fall over. We sat down with a big team of all of the staff and they said, we'll just do one last brain scan and just make sure that it's all clear and the bleeding hasn't increased or anything and then we'll be happy to let him go home. So we were all excited and getting prepared and packing his bags and he had his brain scan and then we found out that the bleed in his brain had almost tripled in size. Basically when the brain gets shaken around, vessels on the surface of the brain can be torn, okay, and bleeding can occur from them. So even though at the time of the accident that bleed may be small, it can cause further bleeding in a delayed fashion. So that's what's happened in him. That shaking, the sh violent shaking of the brain around when, he, when the truck turned over caused a small amount of bleeding on the surface of the brain and then over a period of weeks that bleeding continued, a little micro bleeds occurred and that led to the hematoma that actually developed and was picked up when he came back to the Gold Coast. They basically said from this point on you're going to have to have head surgery where they would drill a, or take a, a round circle of your skull out, clean all the blood out and then put it back together again. So if that surgery wasn't done, firstly he may never have woken up, he may have even died if the bleeding continued. Also further damage to that left hand side of the brain may have occurred and that could have led to what we call hemiplegia which means inability to move one side of the body, and in his case, the right hand side. So obviously we knew that it was incredibly serious, so he was straight in to have the head surgery the next morning. But he's such a fighter, he's so determined to overcome any accident or injury. We weren't worried that he would fall in a heap, we knew he would fight to the end. Anyone that was going to get through that type of accident, it was going to be Matt Minge because he's a fighter. But I'll tell you right now, I don't think any other driver in that field would have pulled through. I don't think I would have. To me, Matt always gets, does what Matt wants to do, you know, and, and maybe being a little bit naive in some ways, I knew the seriousness, but I just never, you know, I didn't sort of think this is ever, you know, if he's either going to be, if he's alive, he's going to be back racing. Never threw a given in, ever. Never, never occurred to me. I, I swear, it frustrates the hell out of me, people who do give in. Um, you know, times times have been bloody tough. You know, things like my, my second or third or fourth surgery, I don't even know what surgery it was called, but they cut me from year to year. And, Going a flip top drawer and put a titanium drawer in and wind my teeth back together again, and that was a tough moment because I was completely with it at the time. But all I wanted to do was get a bed and, and get out of hospital and, and start working back on myself again. So, to answer your question, no, never. The number one thing that motivated him was being able to get back in front of a crowd and get back on the bike and entertain his fans and, and get back to doing stunts again. So the dreaded day had finally come. I was loading my sump bike in the back of my car, my ute, and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm riding. I said, no, you can't. I said, I am. She said, you can't. I said, try and stop me. Matt being Matt, um, anyone could have told him no, and it wouldn't have, it would have, you would have heard a yes anyway, so. He was there, and <laughs> the rest is history. Part of me thought, should you be doing this? And another part thought, well, you have to do this. Even if you do a really shitty job of it, you gotta do this, you know, you, you, you gotta give this a shot. And um, to his credit, he did a really good job, and he got better and better, and he, he'd learnt to live with what he had and make the most of it. Willpower is everything. I think a lot of people in Matt's position would have given up and just said, oh, well, I'm, I'm busted now. I'm, I'm never going to be the same. But Matt's got that will to say, I don't care what the doctors say, I'm, I'm back at it, I'm gonna be, I'm, I'll be back.
yeah, his life was pretty much complete and he's back on track and yeah, the, the joy you could see in his face, it was, it was yeah, that's, that's pretty powerful and pretty moving. The weekend Matt came back and rode at the Cliffs Hall for the first time, I, I fell off my bike and ended up like, you know, now I'm in a wheelchair, you know, myself from stunt riding after all those years thinking it'll never happen to me. But, you know, laying there on the track, you know, I was conscious unlike him. And my whole life was rushing, you know, before my eyes thinking, you know, what am I going to do now? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? And, you know, I guess even, you know, briefly coming back from that, like, it, you know, I wake up every day wishing I could ride my bike. There's, you know, there's no doubt about it. And when you've been doing that your whole life, it's definitely, it's pretty hard to walk away from and not, you know, be part of it anymore, that's for sure. The, the big, massive adrenaline rush and being out there in front of, you know, crowds and everything like that. I guess that's what's pushed him to probably do everything he has, you know, even if he's got nothing to prove, but he did it for him, I guess. He lost his racing license, so he was no longer able to race stadium super trucks for the rest of the season. I honestly thought I could, could go back and start racing straight away, but um, Cam took my license off me, rightfully, rightfully so. So there was no one to race the Hot Wheels truck, so Robbie just put his hand up and said, hey, I'll race it for you. To, to be able to come back and, and drive the Hot Wheels truck in Castro and, and represent Mengay here, um, you know, they were like, okay, who are we going to put in the, in the Mengay truck? I'm like, I'll drive the Mengay truck. And Gordon aboard the number two truck that we'd normally see Matt Mengay in. And Matty is here this weekend, recovering still from that awful incident we had at Detroit earlier this year. And here comes the green flag. Now, nobody knows motorsports pressure more, more than Robbie Gordon. And he has some pressure on him right now. Mingay, both Matt and Sheena, the stunts and crew, Castro, Hot Wheels, what they want to see is that right there. They want to see Robbie Gordon in that truck wide open, just like Matt Mingay will get, and taking the lead away from Shelby Creed as he just did. Right now, the Mingay racing team, stunts Inc., Hot Wheels, Castro Edge, racing team looking really good with that number two Mingay truck piloted by Robbie Gordon right now. You know, both uh, Matt and Sheena, the whole team there, up on their toes right now, cheering on for this win. I think for Gordon here, we're coming to the very end. Now, you see how sideways and how much smoke is coming off the tires there in Gordon's truck? He's no longer being serious. Yeah. He's just messing around right now, having fun. So, uh, we're getting ready to come to the checkered flag, Matt Nolte. And this will be an emotional moment, though. He's gone through amazing. It was an honor to drive that truck uh, because it, it represented Australia, it represented the Mingay family. Finding out I was pregnant with Zali was such an exciting period of our lives. Like, we had waited for this moment for so long, and finally it was here. There's no Zali in like danger, and uh, unfortunately, I think she takes after her brother, little brother and dad, and because uh, she had no fear. I think Matt is, is totally capable of, of getting back into a race car. I know that's what he wants to do. I know that's what his drive is, because this guy is a, is a driven individual. Um, and, you know, he still loves Stadium Super Truck too, which is pretty cool. There's so many old racing opportunities I've missed out on. I can't go off-road racing. I can't um, race Stadium Trucks now, which is what I mo most want to do in the world, is race Stadium Trucks again, just, just to get back in that seat again and prove, prove to everyone that I'm still okay because everybody thinks I'm down out. Uh, and um, that's one reason I'll get so fit, trying to get back on in the seat again. So to get back in that driver's seat, we'll set it be God's and it will make me feel over the moon, on top of the world, if I, if I ever get back in that seat again.
I try and stress uh, six months after my exercise back in my, my super truck, my drift car, and my Harley Sunbike doing shows. And the three and a half years uh, since, since my accident, I'm 600 odd shows without a single miss out. I'm still one piece. I'm doing exactly what I was doing years ago. So for them to see that, I mean, it's frustrating because there'll be a, a, a stadium truck race at a racetrack, and in between I'm doing Harley Sun shows and drift car shows, and yet I'm only hopping in a truck at a race. He's, he's um, sixth sense, his reaction times, everything in there is just as per normal with his driving, so I can't see why he's not allowed back behind an SST and, and jumping for the crowds. He wants to race again, and we all want him to race again, but because he still walks with a bit of a limp and his speech is getting better, like I hadn't spoken to him for a couple of months and every time I speak to him, we don't speak every day, but when we speak I can see massive improvements. And uh, we, I thought the best way to work out whether you know, he's capable of racing is just to put him in a car and sit with him in a car and I can tell you 100% that he has all his motor skills there. But the last advice that I heard from the doctor was don't hit your head hard ever again or you're going to be toast. And I hope that he gets advice to the contrary, uh, but it does concern me that if he is fragile, more fragile than the rest of us, that sooner or later he will have a crash. And knowing what these little trucks are like, racing one similar myself, there's not a lot of give in a steel cage. They jolt you around a lot. And I don't want to see him permanently injured or worse, I would rather have a brother with a bruised ego than a dead brother. This part of the brain controls speech and controls the right hand side. Yeah, right. The fibres cross from the left hand side of the brain down to the right hand side of the body and the speech is in on this side as well. Yeah, right. Okay, so that's what What's a, it's a good explanation for your problem at the moment. Yep. And it was really important that you had surgery for that. And obviously the surgeons that were looking after you at the time did a great job to, to get through that because now the CT scan that we see over here looks pretty good. Okay, so it's a bit different to the MRI. So in this CT scan, we can see your skull. It's the white stuff yep. around here. I can see where the surgeons have been. This is the little piece of Watch bone screws. that they've yeah I've still got them in there. Watch yeah them little titanium screws. screws but we don't see them there but we actually see the piece of bone that they've they took out yep. and put back in and that the brain itself has recovered pretty well at yeah, least at this what we can the see titanium screws, they stay in there for good. Stay in there forever yep. unless there's a reason to take them out yeah, okay, cool. okay so but the brain has made looks like it's made a good recovery although we can't see at the microscopic level okay on these yeah, scans right. So I think you're gonna probably have something that you're gonna take with you forever, yeah, okay? A big welcome back to Matty Bingate. It's his first full-time return to the sport since that big crash at Detroit a few years ago. And he's lost none of that charm, he's lost none of that pizzazz, I guess, to go racing. My whole intention is just to, to finish the race. I want to finish the race one piece, live it, much to the demise of my, my parents and my, my, my wife and my little boy and my little girl. Uh, last thing I really want to do is, is come back injured or even worse. So I just want to make it, make it fun, have a bit of fun out there. So here goes.
Next, Gordon Will and Tony Price. subtle secrets from my fingertips to my unique double helix i can see history i can see the past lessons it's your right never be afraid to ask questions how can every religion claim to be the only one how can they preach love yet fight each other holding guns i think the golden sun might be able to shed some light i'd rather push peace and knowledge to defend our rights these leaders in suits tell us to fight for one side you think they got their sons and daughters on the front line not down for war but down to get an education we're all uh oh, here we go. Where it removes staples from heads. What do you mean they're upside down? You're holding them upside down. Oh, this actually pulls them out. God help us. Cause I won't give this up. These are my shoes, my view, my cue. To say I do give up. Oh, and pretty soon I'm a boom and it'll be alright. Every day's another chance to ignite. This universal feeling called life Who are you to tell me how to live my life? my life? Cause I won't give this up These are my shoes, my view, my cue To say I do give up oh. And pretty soon I'm a boom and it'll be alright Every day's another chance to ignite Cause I'm addicted, oh. I'm addicted, oh. I'm addicted to this universal feeling called life Through the reach of maximum dynamic pressure 